Hello, my name is Rudy Renzel, and this is a sermon I delivered at the Vine Church of Petaluma on June 5th, 2016, and it's called Freedom, Elections, and Democracy. And in this first slide, we see a painting by John Crumble from 1819 called The Declaration of Independence, which is displayed in the United States Capitol Rotunda. And here we see the drafting committee for the Continental Congress presenting their first draft of the Declaration of Independence to the full Congress. On Tuesday, June 7th, this is back in 2016, we have the opportunity to vote in the California primary. Though some of you have voted already by absentee ballot, even though you were not absent. Many feel or believe we have an obligation or duty to vote. I want to explore this issue on the Sunday before the primary. As we read in our Old Testament reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8, God didn't want Israel to have a king. They didn't have one from Moses until Samuel, a period of roughly 400 years. God was their king, what's called a theocracy, though a theocracy can also include when a priest or king rules as God's representative. God told Samuel, by seeking a king like all the other nations, Israel rejected God as their king. He warned them what having a king would entail. In short, they would be slaves to the king. Israel said they wanted a king anyway so they could be like all the other nations. The, the tendency over most of human history until recently has been to have a king ruling, a monarchy instead of a democracy. Throughout mo much of the world's history, the king is identified with God, for example like Pharaoh, or with Alexander the Great as his empire expanded eastward. In our New Testament reading, um, from the book of Acts, we saw, uh, or yeah, the book of Acts, we saw how the apostles Paul and Barnabas selected elders by a show of hands. Though many translations use the word appointed, the Greek has 15 words which translates into English as the word appointed. For example, when Jesus appointed the apostle, Mark uses the Greek word ep epoison a variation of the Greek word poeil. There Jesus did not submit that decision to an election by anyone. However, Luke uses another Greek word, cheritonio, when he described the appointment of elders in the book of Acts. The Greek used that word when they described voting on leaders or making other decisions, such as in Athens, by a show of or stretching forth the hand. Calvin, among many, though not all, believed the early church held elections for their elders, in Greek presbyteros, who governed the local church. In the New Testament, an elder is also interchangeably called an overseer. However, over time, some overseers, also called bishop, in Greek episkopos, at first had influence over other churches, and later held power over them, usually in order to stem the crisis caused by various heresies. Over time they became unelected leaders and began appointing local church leaders rather than holding elections. I want to skip ahead to Geneva during the Reformation. Before the Reformation, a bishop ruled Geneva a form of theocracy, though to various degrees he shared power with a local council. The people of Geneva openly decided, by vote, to accept the reforms begun in Germany and other parts of Switzerland. Calvin, a reformer in France, fled to Switzerland to escape persecution in France. He wrote The Institutes of Christian Religion in 1536 and became instantly famous. The book so impressed Farrell, a reformer in Switzerland, 
He persuaded Calvin to remain in Geneva and head up the Reformation there the same year. Calvin, along with the other reformers, deeply believed in and emphasized the priesthood of all believers. This view provided a base of equality among believers, rather than a hierarchy of spirituality centered in a religious class. It also provided a foundation for having church members vote on church matters. It also provided a basis for extending voting rights to ordinary citizens in society. Over time, Calvin, a French refugee, completely transformed Geneva, not only the church, but the entire society. Protestant refugees fled there from Catholic persecutions in France, in England, in Scotland, and the Netherlands. John Knox from Scotland described Geneva as the finest school of Christ on earth since the Apostles. Those who fled to Geneva went back to their countries and attempted to implement what they learned there. In some countries, such as the Netherlands and Scotland, they had more success. In England, they had mixed results. In France, the king massacred most of the Protestant Huguenots on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. In England, after King Henry VIII broke with Rome in 1532 to 1533, Thomas Kramer led England in a Reformation path. Henry's son Edward continued this Protestant path, though he soon died. Mary, Henry's daughter, succeeded in 1553 as a confirmed Catholic, so many Protestants fled to Geneva. However, she soon died five years later, and Elizabeth I succeeded her in 1558. Though Protestant, she pursued a middle way to include many Catholic practices. James the Sixth, King of Scotland, succeeded Elizabeth as James the First of England in 1603. Though Catholic and favoring Catholics, he also tried to please Protestants, such as his attempts to produce a new English translation of the Bible by sound scholars, which eventually became known as the King James Bible in 1611, which just celebrated its 400th anniversary a few years ago. The, set, the son of James I, Charles I, succeeded James upon his death in 1625. He ruled England, Scotland, and Ireland until his death in 1649. As many Catholic rulers, he deeply believed in the divine rights of kings. This placed him in a deep division with many Protestants in Parliament who deeply believed God placed limits on kings, especially the rights of Englishmen going back to the Magna Carta to consent uh, to any new taxes through Parliament, their representatives. Charles essentially refused this. He sought to raise taxes without Parliament. Parliament fought against him, won, and eventually decided to behead him in 1649 since they believed he wasn't following the law. It marks one of the first times in history that a nation made a considered decision to behead their monarch based on a, on a finding that he didn't follow the law, especially by seeking to raise taxes without the consent of Parliament. For 11 years from 1649 to 1660, England, along with Scotland and Ireland, had no king. At first Parliament ruled, however, it remained deeply divided over many critical issues. Out of frustration, Oliver Cromwell dissolved the Parliament in 1653 and assumed a new office of Lord Protector. He sought spiritual and moral reform of the nation as well as healing and stability. Some consider him a dictator, while others consider him a hero of liberty. He died in 1558, and England reached out to the son of Charles I, Charles II, to restore a monarchy 
1660. And the painting there is by Samuel Cooper. It's a painting of Oliver Cromwell, made in 1656, which hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in London. Meanwhile, the Scottish Reformation had been developing, especially after John Knox fled to Geneva, where he learned directly from Calvin. Uh, much earlier, uh, around 1554 to 1559, from Catholic persecution and his return after that. Later, Samuel Rutherford rose up to continue the Scottish Reformation. In 1644, before Charles I was deposed and beheaded, Rutherford wrote the important book Lex Rex, which in Latin means the law is king. It refuted from a biblical perspective the view about the divine rights of king. Instead, Rutherford forcefully argued from the Bible that the king, as a servant of God, was under the law, what we now call the rule of law. He emphasized the Presbyterian view of the Lordship of Christ. Christ, as the king, the head of the church, as well as the deep love and intimate companion of our life. When the English restored monarchy with Charles II in 1660, it wasn't long before the government charged Rutherford with treason for writing that the king was subject to the law and urging resistance in obedience to Christ when the king violated the law. However, Rutherford died of natural causes before being brought up on these charges. And there we see a statue of uh, John Knox and a painting of Samuel Rutherford by Robert Walker. Rutherford directly impacted American democracy through John Witherspoon, a Presbyterian minister from Scotland who immigrated to New Jersey in 1768 to become president of the College of New Jersey a Presbyterian institution in Princeton, which later became Princeton University. He taught from Lex Rex and other Presbyterian books. His students included James Madder, Madison, considered the father of the United States Constitution, other founding fathers, and many senators, congressmen, judges, etc. Witherspoon participated in the discussions about the Declaration of Independence and signed it. Though he did not sign the Constitution, he greatly influenced it. I'll return to the Constitution later, and there we see a portrait of John Witherspoon by Charles Wilson Peale, made in 1790. Meanwhile, back in England, though England initially was happy to restore the monarchy in 1660 with Charles II. The relationship soon turned sour and he often conflicted with Parliament. He officially belonged to the Church of England but favored Catholicism. He converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. The biggest concern was that his successor would not be Catholic. Protestants still worried about the St. Bartholomew Massacre of the Huguenots in France from 1572. They also remembered the persecutions under Henry's daughter Mary, also called Bloody Mary. They generally regarded a Catholic king to represent a grave loss of freedom. Four pregnancies with his wife Catherine from Portugal resulted in miscarriages or stillbirths. Charles II, also known as the Mary King, had twelve illegitimate children. Upon his death, his brother James II succeeded him in 1685. As I just said, James II, the brother of Charles II, succeeded to the British throne in 1685. He was secretly a Catholic something England did not allow for their king at that time. However, he had openly married a Catholic, Mary of Modena, an Italian princess, as his second wife. 
something which made England nervous. In 1688, Queen Mary gave birth to a Roman Catholic son, James Francis Edward, who would eventually become the King of England. This event proverbially broke the camel's back and sparked a revolution. The Protestant daughter of James II had married the Protestant William of Orange, a prince of the Principality of Orange, as well as a stockholder, a lord, of several provinces in the Netherlands. Many British leaders worried about a Catholic king invited William to come and take control. William took up their invitation and landed in England with an army in 1688. James II sized up the situation and decided to leave England, considered an abdication. The Parliament declared William and Mary as co-rulers of England, William III. This became known as the Glorious Revolution, or the Bloodless Revolution. The, the American colonists knew this history. They knew English kings had been deposed when they did not follow the law. Though they wanted to obey authorities, they knew under both English laws as well as Protestant principles that a magistrate who goes against the law, God's laws must be resisted in order to submit to the Lordship of Christ. That is why so many of them fought in opposition to the king, whom they believed violated their rights as Englishmen. Let's look back at the wonderful language they developed and published to the world to express not only why they were fighting, but why they were declaring their independence from the King of England. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their security. Such has been the patient suffering of these colonies, and such now is the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. They go on to list 28 particular items of grievances to show the long train of abuses and usurpations which gave them the right and duty to throw off that government. The most important one, they complained the king had imposed taxation upon them without their consent. They also speak about how the people of Britain abused them. They conclude by declaring our independence. 
you should consider reading this great document once a year, perhaps on the 4th of July. At this point, I want to contrast the American Revolution with the French Revolution, which occurred just a few years later. The French did not have a Protestant heritage to draw from. If you recall, they had massacred the Protestant Huguenots back in 1572 on St. Bartholomew's Day. The leaders of the French Revolution also asserted the rights of man and the right of revolution, but on a secular basis. They rejected the church and religion because the Catholic Church supported the king based on the divine rights of king. Without a solid basis for government, the French Revolution soon descended into a bloodbath known as the Reign of Terror. To end the anarchy of military leader, Napoleon soon established a dictatorship and then later named himself as the Emperor, soon waging war on Europe. In contrast, in America, the founders wanted to build our government on a solid biblical basis, a solid foundation. They remembered that God had told Israel that he didn't want them to have a king. They looked to church government with voting members as a model for our civic government. The, in creating a constitution for our government, they remembered the biblical teaching that man is sinful. Therefore, they set up a system of checks and balances, along with separation of powers, so that no one man or woman would hold too much power. They limited the federal government by enumerating what powers it had and reserving all other powers to the states. Most important, they began it in big letters, We the People, drawing a parallel to our understanding of the Church as the people of God. However, they avoided attaching these views to any one denomination. And here we have a painting of the signing of the Constitution of the United States by Howard Chandler Christie, made in 1940, which is displayed at the U.S. House of Representatives. For some time now, several forces have been eroding the biblical foundation of our government. The strongest forces seek not to not only avoid any sense of biblical morality, they want to keep any consideration or mention of God out of public life, which runs completely counter to what the founders established. If this erosion continues over time, it's possible our system of government, our rights, our freedoms, could collapse. We then could possibly face something similar to the anarchy experienced in the French Revolution or even the Russian Revolution, both which saw dictators or totalitarian regimes follow. What should we do? We should strengthen what remains. This is what Jesus says to the church in Sardis in the third chapter of the book of Revelations. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Bob Dylan turned this into a great song, When You Gonna Wake Up. We should exercise our right to vote to strengthen the biblical foundation of our country. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to vote from the pulpit, but you can ask me how I'm going to vote after the service if you're interested. We should pray for our government, something we do now every Sunday at the vine. Uh, John, the author of the book of Revelation, oh, I'm sorry, no, John from our church goes and prays at the Petaluma City Council meetings. You can join him. There are many other things you can do to get involved in our government, but there is no one formula. We can pray that the Holy Spirit leads us in what each of us can do. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll take a look at some of my other sermons up on YouTube, and God bless. Bye-bye.